Dr. Humphreys, who everyone knows, uh, is going to talk to us about surgical uh, innovators. And I think it's one of the things that we've sort of focused on this year in terms of innovation. So I'd be interested in your perspectives over this time course. Sterling. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, good morning again. I'm still Sterling Humphrey, just like I was 10 minutes ago. And uh, like Dr. Farmer said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some surgeon inventors, both uh, in history as well as uh, hopefully tell you a little bit about what all of you can do if you maybe are like myself and thinking of various inventions or things, um, then how you can better your profession. So I have no disclosures, although I will say a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about I have not personally gone through, although I've talked to several individuals that have. So over my time here, thinking about uh, all of the various grand rounds and topics that I have heard over the seven years, I uh, was thinking to myself, what actually caught my interest? Which of the ones did I particularly enjoy? For me, I actually really liked the ones that talked about first the surgical heritage of all of us and then moved forward to the 21st century uh, issues of today. I also want to talk about something somewhat novel that I haven't heard in the 351 grand rounds that I've sat in these chairs uh, listening to, which all of us has that, that uh, as one of their goals, of course. And then also particularly thinking back of the chief lectures that I've heard, what stuck out with me. And I like the ones that they taught me a little bit about themselves that I didn't otherwise know. And then last, I really wanted to pick something that was a topic that I'd been chewing on for several years um, and just hadn't spent the time looking it up and researching. So the light bulb went off for me and I decided, you know what, let's talk about inventions. Something that I think a lot of us in this room have had various ideas that they think about or talk amongst each other, you know, in the cafeteria, um, but maybe not have taken to the next level. So uh, I think us as surgeons, we're very strategic individuals, very innovative people, and I think that it lends itself to medical inventions and devices um, quite well, but I don't think that all of us um, utilize that to our full advantage. We are busy we decide, you know what, that's probably a dumb idea, put it under the rug and nothing ever gets done with it. So my objectives today, a couple things. One, I want to talk to you about some surgeon inventors that have been prominent in our history and our heritage, also their contribution to medicine even today. Also I'm going to talk to you about what a super inventor is and what some uh, common traits are of those uh, individuals. And hopefully in the end, I'll inspire a few of you to take those ideas to the next level and give you a couple tools uh, to help you take it from just an idea into reality. So we'll start with these two individuals first. So there was, uh, for Dr. Bovey, there was a, a fascinating article actually in the American Journal of Surgery in May of 2013. I encourage you all to read it. I'm going to summarize some of the, the facts that it stated in here, but it's actually a very interesting story. So William Bovey was born on September 11th, 1882 in Augusta, which is a small town in southwest Michigan. His father died in 1901, forcing him to pursue his higher education with reduced financial means. He briefly attended a local business school in Kalamazoo, then enrolled in Albion College next to his hometown, and later transferred to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he received his bachelor's degree in 1905. After working for a short time as a college instructor to pay off his debt in Ohio, he took an undergrad, uh, um, sorry, took a graduate study at the University of Missouri. While there, he met his future wife, Martha Adams, and they were wed in 1909. After uh, Bovey attained his master's degree in 1910, the couple moved to Boston, where in 1914, Bovey uh, was awarded his PhD in plant physiology through Harvard. He then took a junior faculty position at the Harvard Associated Huntington Hospital for Cancer Research. Both in his school days and in subsequent research years at Harvard, Bovey, like many gifted individuals, enjoyed challenging the status quo. Prior to Bovey's work, he had been learned that uh, above a certain frequency, electricity would actually flow through living tissue without creating generalized muscle contractions, but the current would cause local heating of the tissues at the point of entry. Indeed, five years before Bovey's patent, in 1926, a patent was granted to William Bierman of New York City for a primitive device that actually used heat to sever tissues. It actually uh, was essentially an electrified pincher forceps. 
Interestingly, although the patent citations of current generations of cautery devices today often trace back to this 1926 patent, um, but uh, um, Bierman has all but been lost to history. So unlike Bierman's earlier device, Bovey's patent actually included diagrams that remain easily recognizable uh, by modern surgeons today as a Bovey. Despite his innovation, the name Bovey would likely be little known today if it had not been for the happy coincidence that Huntington Hospital was just down the street from the new Peter Brent Brigham Hospital, where Dr. Harvey Cushing had been working some years as the surgeon in chief. Cushing, who trained at Hopkins under Halstead, was by then a surgeon of international standing who remained rightfully remembered today as the father of neurosurgery. In late 1926, it was the fortuitous confluence of geographical proximity, Cushing's need for a better hemostatic strategy for an especially challenging patient, and his insight for the potential of using Bovis device for this particular patient that had put electrocautery on the road to widespread acceptance. The idea of using electrosurgical devices as a surgical tool is said to have first come to Cushing when one of his colleagues saw at a trade show a demonstration of electrosurgical desiccation of a piece of beef and jokingly uh, talked to Cushing and said, um, how do you think this new fendangled gizmo might work on the brain? Although unintended, this may have led to the subsequent eureka moment for Cushing. A few months later, he operated on a specially difficult patient with a large parietal tumor, but severe bleeding forced Cushing to abandon his planned resection. Electrocautery must have occurred to him as a possible solution for shortly after this uh, failed surgery, he contacted Bovey to solicit his help for another attempt. Bovey agreed and reportedly brought the desk-sized device to the Brigham by rolling it down the street from his lab at Huntington on a handcart. The use of the apparatus required jerry-rigging mo and modification of the Brigham's operating room wiring, but there was no historical mention of Cushing having these plans looked over by an investigational review board or ethics committee. He re the reoperation took place on October 1st, 1926. It was arguably as significant a surgical event as Morton's classic demonstration of ether anesthesia some 80 years prior. As before, there was much local interest in the trial of Bovey's new machine. Cushing himself described a carnival atmosphere which included the presence of numerous members of the New England Surgical Association, a surgical assistant who actually had to scrub out from the Bovey fumes, and observers who suffered from flu coughing throughout the procedure, and a medical student who was actually on call as a possible warm blood donor who fainted. It was no doubt quite a spectacle with the reserved and precise Cushing hover, hovering over the patient while Bovey off to the side fiddled with the controls of his apparatus. In the end, Cushing successfully removed the lemon-sized tumor with much improved hemostasis. The patient made a full and rapid recovery. Although Cushing's growing experience with electrosurgery led more to success than failure, there were moments of technical excitement along the way. In one such case, the current short-circuited through the metal retractor, traveled up Cushing's arm, and exited through his headlight. In recounting the matter, Cushing dryly noted, quote, it was unpleasant to say the least. On another memorable occasion, Cushing bovied into the frontal sinus while the patient was under ether anesthetic, igniting the vapors in a, that went off in a blue flame. Fortunately, the patient was not injured. It is written that in some future cases after this event, the team tried to reduce explosive potential by administering the ether per rectum. Cushing's overall impressions of electrosurgical potential led to his landmark case series uh, in December 1928, where he published in the, surgery, the Journal of Surgery, Gynecology, and Obstetrics, which was the official journal of the American College of Surgeons at that time. In this article, Cushing wrote, and I quote, Surgery is a conservative art. It takes to new methods reluctantly as an old dog to new tricks. It was slow to adopt the ligature, slow to adopt the principles of antisepsis, slow to adopt the fastidious technique and painstaking hemostasis that have largely put a stop to operating by the clock. From a technical standpoint, the principles of electrosurgery are likely to be no less revolutionary. Increasingly thereafter, electrosurgery became part of the mainstream surgical practice. Although Bovey was without question a brilliant man, he lacked much instinct for personal financial security. When he patented his apparatus in 1931, which he was listed as the sole inventor, he conveyed his patent to the device's manufacturing company for $1. 
Later in life, he maintained that he had no interest in reaping personal reward from his invention. Now, here's my first invention. So I was about seven years old when I invented the Pooper Scooper. That was its name back 20-something uh, years ago. Uh, and this is a, a perfect example of necessity bringing inspiration. So I managed at that time to convince my parents that I needed a dog like every other little boy does, uh, but quickly realized that I hated cleaning up dog poop. But I actually hated even more running away from my dad when he'd hit it with the weed whacker. So I decided to come up with the pooper scooper. I went out in our wood pile in the backyard, started hacking and sawing away with the concept in my mind that I was going to make this device that has some handles on it with a wheel that had some cups and I would just wheel it around the yard and as a cup hit it, it would just pick up the dog poop, problem solved. Unfortunately, this only made it to its first version as I did not have the foresight to uh, realize that uh, cleaning out the cans would be far worse than taking a simple garden hose. So that was abandoned. That brings us to these two, Dr. Denton Cooley and Dr. Domingo Luida. So Dr. Luida was born November 29th of 1924 in Argentina. His parents were Italian immigrants, and in 1949 he graduated as a medical doctor from the National University of Cordoba in Argentina. In 1955, just six years after receiving his degree, he developed a technique for early diagnosis of tumors in the pancreas. He then went on to train in thoracic and cardiac surgery with professors Paul Santi and Pierre Moron of Lyon, France. His early work in developing an artificial heart date back to 1958, a mere three years after his graduation. At this point, this is where he developed an early prototype that was successfully used in small animals. After publishing the results of his study, Dr. Leota was hired at Baylor College of Medicine as director of the artificial heart program by Dr. Michael DeBakey in 1961. During the 1960s, he worked closely with Dr. DeBakey and created a left ventricular assist device, also known as an LVAD, in addition to the total artificial heart implanted by Dr. Cooley, Dr. Denton Cooley. He was born on August 22nd, 1920 in Houston, Texas. He graduated in 1941 from the University of Texas in Austin and majored in zoology. He became interested in surgery through several pre-med classes that he attended in college and actually began his medical education at the University of Texas in Galveston. He completed his medical degree and his surgical training at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. In the 1950s, Cooley returned to Houston to become associate professor at Baylor, and during this time he worked with uh, Dr. DeBakey on developing new methods for repairing aortic aneurysms. In 1960, Dr. Cooley moved his practice to St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital while continuing to teach at Baylor, and in 1962 he founded the Texas Heart Institute. He was known for being technically gifted in the operating room and demonstrated this by performing numerous bloodless open heart surgeries on Jehovah's Witnesses beginning in the early 1960s. Also in the 1960s, Dr. Cooley worked on developing new artificial heart valves and played a central role in decreasing uh, mortality for valve replacement from a staggering 70% down to 8%. In 1969, he became the first heart surgeon to implant an artificial heart designed by Domingo Leota in a man, Hassel Karp, who lived for 65 hours. In addition to his great surgical skill, he was also known as a great visionary and had multiple inventions throughout his career and several patents, several of which are shown here today. My next invention. So this was about the age of 10. Like every 10-year-old little boy, I liked guns, but was not allowed to have one. Somewhere through my course, I also managed to learn that apparently batteries explode, and I thought, what a perfect projectile. Amazingly, this, <laughs> this gun that I'm showing you here was not my own, and you can actually go on the website, someone with enough, uh, I'm assuming higher than the age of 10, actually you know, placed this on the website as a good idea. So thought I'd give credit where credit is due. Fortunately for me and my family and everyone else, I quickly abandoned this idea and it never came to fruition. Otherwise, obviously, we know what bad things can happen. And, you know, this is a small world, for all you know. I could have ended up at this fine institution getting the Davis hello in the trauma bay. Can't talk about Dr. Cooley without talking about Dr. DeBakey. 
So Dr. DeBakey was born in Lake Charles, Louisiana on September 7, 1908, to Lebanese immigrants Shaker and Rihija DeBakey. This was later Anglicized to Dr. DeBakey. Dr. DeBakey received his MD from Tulane, uh, and he remained in New Orleans to complete his internship and residency at Charity Hospital. He completed surgical fellowships at the University of Strasbourg, France, under Professor, Professor René Lariche, and at the University of Heidelberg, Germany, under Professor Martin Kirschner. Returning to Tulane, he served as surgical faculty from 1937 to 1948, and from 1942 to 1946, he was on military leave as a member of the Surgical Consultants Division, Office of the Surgeon General of the Army. DeBakey helped to develop the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, also known as MASH units, and later helped establish the Veterans Administration Medical Center Research System. He joined the faculty at Baylor in 1948 and served as chairman of that department until 1993. He was president of the college from 1969 to 1979 and served as chancellor from 1979 to January of 1996, and then he was named Chancellor Emeritus. DeBakey's ability to bring the professional, his professional knowledge to bear on public policy earned him the reputation as a medical statesman. He was a member of the Medical Advisory Committee in the Hoover Commission and was chairman of the President's Commission on Heart Disease, Cancer, and Stroke during the Johnson administration. He worked in numerous capacities to improve national and international standards in healthcare. Among these numerous consultative appointments was a three-year membership in the National Advisory Heart and Lung Council of the National Institute of Health. At age 23, while still in medical school, DeVakey developed the roller pump, the significance of which was not realized until 20 years later when it became an essential component of the heart-lung machine. With his mentor, Alton Oshner, he postulated in 1939 a strong link between smoking and carcinoma of the lung. DeBakey is one of the first to perform coronary artery bypass surgery, and in 1953, he performed the first successful carotid endarterectomy. A pioneer in the development of an artificial heart, DeBakey was the first to use an external heart pump successfully in a patient. DeBakey also pioneered the use of Dacron grafts to replace or repair blood vessels, and in 1958, he performed the first successful patch graft angioplasty. In the 1960s, DeBakey and his team of surgeons were among the first to record surgeries on film. A camera operator would actually lie atop a surgical film stand made to DeBakey's specifications and record a surgeon's eye view of the operating area. DeBakey worked together with Denton Cooley while they both practiced at the Baylor College of Medicine, and according to the April 10, 1970 issue of Life magazine, they had a disagreement associated with Cooley's apparently unauthorized implementation of the first artificial heart in a human. DeBakey had set the surgery for Friday, April 4th of 1969, but had scheduling conflicts um, and uh, quickly uh, rescheduled it for the following Monday. Cooley then rescheduled it back to the original date and performed the surgery while DeBakey was out of town. DeBakey practiced medicine until the day he died at the age of 99. His contributions to the field of medicine spanned the better part of 75 years. In addition to his novel ideas, DeBakey operated on more than 50,000 patients. So while I was in high school, sitting in physics class, I thought I had an epiphany. I was, uh, at the time, this was before electric cars were mainstream. We were discussing kinetic en energy, and I thought, why not put basically, effectively, generators as a braking system of a car instead of simply turning all that energy into heat? I then rushed home did some research, and to my dismay, not only was this idea devised over 100 years ago, it actually was produced in 1901. I quickly abandoned my excitement, saddened that I wasn't the child prodigy I thought I was. However, I did get some gratification a few years later when the Prius came out actually sporting this idea to the mainstream. Dr. Gary Michelson, this is probably the poster child of modern surgical innovators. He was one of four boys and raised by his mother and grandmother. He witnessed his grandmother's spinal deformity, um, which caused him to uh, pursue a, medicine, a career in medicine, particularly in orthopedic spine. He received his medical degree from Hanneman Medical College, where he also completed his residency in orthopedic surgery. He later then went to St. Luke's Medical Center for fellowship, specifically in spine. Dr. Michelson was in private practice for over 25 years before retiring. In that time, he amassed over 100 publications to his credit. 
Unhappy with the low success rates associated with spinal surgery at the beginning of his career, he developed new technology in response to creating implants, instruments, and procedures that would enable spine surgeons to manage more spinal ailments. The, quote, Michelson devices have been implanted globally in hundreds of thousands of patients. He has over 250 U.S. patents on instruments, methods, and devices for advances in spinal and orthopedic surgery and over 950 issued or pending patents worldwide. In 2005, Michelson won a legal battle with Medtronic over the origins of his patents. Dr. Michelson was ultimately awarded $1.35 billion, that's with a B, launching him to the top 400 richest people in the United States. To this day, the logo Michelson Technology at Work is displayed all over the Medtronic's products. In 2011, Dr. Michelson was induced into the Inventors Hall of Fame, joining but 500 inventors such as Steve Jobs and Dr. Thomas J. Fogarty. So what is it about these individuals that make them unique? What makes somebody a super inventor? It's a toy, uh, term that I'm coining that's going to describe individuals with amazing intuition and inventorship. Why is it that some people possess this skill? Most of us are smart, hardworking, yet the vast majority of us will invent or better um, procedures uh, with uh, uh, not uh, invent or uh, better procedures at all in our careers. So what makes a super innovator? So I thought about this for a while, and uh, with doing my research, I decided that I came up with 11 traits of the super inventor. Number one. Inventors actually don't fall in love with their ideas. Your ideas are not your children. Successful inventors understand the importance of detaching themselves from their ideas and abandoning them when necessary. Number two, they test their ideas early. Have your ideas, put them down to basically where the rubber meets the road and see if they work. If not, abandon them. Understand how to use intellectually prop intellectual property to protect your ideas. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but to be successful, you have to have a basic understanding of how copyrights, trademarks, and patents work. No one's going to do that for you, and it's assumed in the business, and certainly in the 21st century, that you will protect your intellectual property. Number four, stick to one industry. You can't be an expert in everything, so whether it be neurosurgery, cardiac surgery, or something like endoscopy, stick to something and forge mutually beneficial relationships in that industry. Don't be afraid to outsource. We all think that we're experts at everything, but we all know that we're not. All the examples that I gave you, there was multiple people that had uh, those individuals excel to super inventors. They didn't do it on their own. Be smart about your time and help let everybody or other people help you. Realize success is up to you. Understand that you are going to be the one that ultimately champions your idea across the finish line, and you're going to work harder than anyone else. Certainly, I don't think anyone in this room is afraid of being number six. Have a sense of urgency. Anyone who's done benchtop research realizes it takes a long time to go from an idea to a concept or a product. So get started now. It's never the right time. Be persistent. You will be rejected. And rather than being discouraged and giving up like I did on my pooper scooper, go ahead and uh, learn from your mistakes and what went wrong and try again. Thomas Edison said, I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Number nine, don't let your emotions betray you. In the end, it is a business and it's not personal. Number 10, do not be afraid to fail. In my research, I ran across this guy, Charles Lamprey, who's done a bunch of crazy inventions, but he said, fail fast and fail often, or you won't be able to move on until you do. And last, but certainly not least, trust your intuition. If you read the biographies of several super inventors, that's an ongoing theme that they say is they trusted their intuition and that's what served them well. So hopefully I inspired a few of you to take your ideas to the next level, but we still haven't answered the how. How do you do that? So obviously taking an idea to a product is a very arduous course and very complicated. So we're going to just focus on the upper left hand corner here. Basically we're going to take the idea and move it to proof of concept, and at least get your foot in the door. So you have that idea. You basically have one of two paths that you can go. You can go down the entrepreneur and open an LLC or an incorporation. 
or more commonly, particularly in medical professionals, will be with corporate sponsorship. Obviously, doing the business side of things complicates things dramatically, so we're going to just focus on the corporate sponsorship model. So the corporate sponsorship is, partnership is exactly that. You have an idea, you go to a, a already established corporation and try and work together in coming up and devising your, uh, your idea. So what are they going to look at? So they're going to want to know um, what's the predicted benefit to the patient, which is the same thing you want to know. What's the technologic and market fit? What's the estimated time and cost to getting this idea up and running? Does it complement with other products and platforms already available today, particularly the ones that might be patented by the company that you present this to? And what's the competition, regulation, and reimbursement? You, as an inventor, also have to do your homework, and there's two important things that you have to answer before you uh, step into this partnership. One is understand intellectual property. Do you actually have intellectual property that can be protected by patents? Also, uh, you know, do a patent search yourself. See if you're infringing on someone else's ideas. And also, have an idea in your mind of what you are willing to accept for a non-disclosure agreement. What that basically means is, if you go to a company and submit your idea, that they will actually keep your knowledge in confidence for a designated period of time. Usually that's three to five years. Not all of them do that, as I will show. Also, what do you need to bring forth and how far do you have to have this idea or concept to bring it to a, uh, an actual partnership? So several have you know, drawings or prototypes, but you don't need that. All you really need is specific designs, materials, dimensions, performance characteristics, and the impact on patient and underlying disease. Remember that this is your idea. You are the expert at this. And so you, uh, the better you explain and the more detailed you are, the more likely the partnership is going to work. So you've done all this hard work. How are, is somebody uh, reimbursed for this hard work and their ingenuity? So the way it is, is with royalties. The most common way is somebody has a patent, and uh, then they go to a company to license that patent and make their product. A patent here in the United States is good for 20 years, and usually the royalties are paid for the duration of that patent. Although it's important for everyone to understand that you don't have to have a patent to actually go up and present your idea. If you don't, then you uh, are negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis with these individuals, and your reimbursement is based on a shorter time frame, usually three to eight years, and it's dependent on um, the, the market that you are um, entering. The royalties ranging are from one and a half to eight percent, with an industry average of three percent of net sales. So say you have this idea, patent or not, and you want to take it to the next level, how do you find these companies that will actually help you do this? Several ways. We're in 2016. The most common and easiest way is to actually do a web search. So I did. So I just went and typed in a couple you know, words in a web search, and you can come up with several major companies that in three steps basically will um, let you initiate the uh, conversation for product development. As I mentioned earlier, it is important that you understand the copyrights, trademarks, and what intellectual property means. Here, if you looked at Applied Medical at the bottom here, Number two, it says here that they will only consider your ideas on a non-confidential basis. So it's things that you can get yourself in trouble if you're not careful. That said, we are all at a university and things work a little bit different here and actually uh, works to our advantage in my mind. So a little background. In 1980, Congress passed the Bay Dole Act, which opened the way for universities to patent innovations from government-funded research, license those patents, and share the royalties with their inventors. In 2004 alone, American universities collected more than $1.39 billion in licensing revenue and applied for more than 10,000 patents. Here at the University of California, we also are very fortunate in the University of California, which obviously encompasses all of them, but we are the number one producer of patents in, out of any university in the United States. So here at UC Davis, what do you do? Specifically, it's through the Office of Research, and you go to the Innovation Access website and team, which is shown here. If you have an idea, it's literally as simple as clicking on that link of disclose an invention, which then will bring you to a three-page form that just gives you basics about your idea and how you think that it could contribute to, to medicine. Once you have that record of invention, 
then it's assigned to uh, the innovation access team with a number and they do a quick patent search. Based on that, it's precursory. They will see if they think maybe you have an idea that can go somewhere, then they will have a joint innovation access meeting. From there, they basically answer two questions. Do they feel that your idea is patentable and does it have commercial potential? And then these fall into three categories, either yes, which then the, pat the patent is initiated. They have their own patent team and will pay for it for you. The maybe pile, which just basically means they need more information. This could be either through clinical trials or maybe a further descriptor on why you think this has commercial potential. And they may or may not give you a provisional patent. All that is is a 12-month span of time that protects your intellectual property. Um, but if you don't move on to a full patent, it'll dissolve in 12 months. And then there's the no pile, which always means no. So depending on where you fall in those three piles, you might have to remember back or touch base on uh, this grand rounds and remember the 12 or 11 traits that I told you in that you will fail, you will learn from those mistakes, but never give up. So hopefully I was able to teach you guys and inspire a few people to then, you know, think about ideas that they've had and maybe take it to the next level. I did go through a few of the prominent surgeon inventors and how they contributed to medicine today the common traits of the super inventors and what that means and hopefully gave you the tools to take it to the next level and turn an idea into reality. Wanted to take the moment and say a few things. I'm very proud to be from UC Davis and I thank you all for the seven years that I've been here. To the residents, I had three things. Number one, remember this is your heritage. Be proud of it and continue to make it better. Number two, enjoy the process and take care of each other while going through it. And number three, and this is particularly for the second year residents who are trying to break this mold, this is and always will be a beer drinking program, so embrace it. For faculty, so I'm forever grateful at the fact that you guys have shown me what I can do, that I can do more than I ever thought was possible. Thank you for a wonderful seven years. And in reflecting on my time, the thing that I am most grateful for that you all provided is you made this a safe place to ask why. And last but not least, got to thank my family, my wife Erica, my son Jax, and my baby girl Elise. They not only stood by me, but they also sacrificed for the betterment of my career and my future patients. Thank you. So Sterling, you know you're really not done yet. Not done yet, nope. <laughs> So I did, uh, everyone probably knows, but I also uh, signed up for another two years with cardiac surgery, hence the reason that I talked primarily about some CT surgeons. And we're thrilled to be having you stay here. So as you reflect back now on um, your early life in innovation and some of the great innovators, how do, you, how do you see this going forward for you? Yeah, I certainly had not disclosed everything. that it was more fun to talk about the little childish things that I've come, but I certainly have ideas that... I've committed to myself internally that I'm going to take to the next level and at least you know research and, and go from there. Um, again, it's something that I think about often. I know that we've talked about it in passing with several of the residents, and I, I think that we should all commit to, when you have that idea, to at least talk to somebody about it. I think UC Davis in particular, we're in a great location in Northern California where we have a lot of resources, and with Silicon Valley just down the road where we can certainly utilize this. And, I know Dr. Farmer is, is uh, trying to make this a, a bigger, better place for innovation, and there's certainly resources here to help. In every little thing we use as a tool in surgery or any new operation was, was the idea of someone who was sitting there doing it one day, whether it's, you know, I still want someone to make a better NG tube, so that's out there. <laughs> uh, and lots of, lots of all those little things you know, matter and make our patients' lives better in yeah, terms absolutely. of how we do things. So I do think it's a responsibility for academic physicians to think about how we can move the field forward. Yeah. People have questions or comments? Take them. to invent something through, like, the University of California system. Mm -hmm. um, how much money does the university keep versus uh, what, what is yours? Yeah, so... I think you spend some of yeah, you do, and hopefully I was not giving the people the impression that, you know, to do this for money, it's, you know, certainly one, an intellectual 
challenge and also you know the betterment of society and you know what we do and our patients. Um, the University of California, basically, so I, I told you how it was one and a half to eight percent with a national average of three percent. So basically, uh, going through the University of California, you would most of those go through those partnerships, and then the university keeps seventy percent of that fraction, and you get thirty percent of that fraction, rough and dirty. However, the biggest challenge I think for young people in, in inventing things is supporting a patent. So the cost of filing a patent is, Shin, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so you're looking at $100,000 and you have to pay that on a regular basis to maintain that patent. So that's really where young people um, are at a disadvantage in terms of either that's where angel investors come in if you're completely on your own, you get someone else to talk to talk into to um, support that patent for you, uh, but the university will support it if they if you are in you know box A, the university will actually incur those costs, and so it truly becomes a partnership with you and the university with respect to uh, the patent process, sure. or they'll release it to you. Yeah. It's such a great topic and a, and, a, and a wonderful topic. I think the most important thing in my mind is that the, the real invention. having the med students and residents involved. And the, the reason is because you guys are smarter than us in a lot of different ways, but you're not thinking this is the way you have to do things. And sometimes the best questions are from people that have no training at all and say, why do you do it? Why, why do you do laparoscopy like that? Like, it makes no sense to have some big stick in your hand and poison that kid. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense why we do it that way, but you know, it takes people that are young and that aren't stuck in the system to question why. And that's, I, I think it's really important to realize that your guys' goals and your guys' questions are are incredibly valid and the way we look at this whole thing. Yeah, thank you. I also think that this uh, this department has a history of great innovators and great inventors, and Bill Blaisdell, I think, is one of the examples of someone who completely revolutionized the way we do vascular surgery and yeah. and was a very novel, innovative guy in his time. And I think we lose sight of that when we um, sometimes, as Shane said, we, you get comfortable as a surgeon in what has worked for you, so there's a reluctance to change that. But always asking those questions, why do we do it this way, is important. So thank you for inspiring all of us to think that way. And we look forward cool. to two more years of you in... Davis. Two more. Right. Thank you.